Okay, welcome everybody. And this is a short discussion with regards to education. And it's been long questioned for at least for the last 20 years of this century is that there is a big gap between education and business. Well, it's not the only gap because there are more gaps that education seems to be throwing up. <laughs> Certainly in the past two or three years, we've had a lot of pressure put on the arts being squeezed out of secondary school budgets because not many people are signing up for these art so-called lessons. So I've got two eminent guests with me today. I have Anne Packard and Mark Timmins, and I'm just going to ask them to introduce themselves very briefly, and then we'll get on with answering what's the purpose of education. So over to you, Anne. Ladies first. Right. Um, Anne Packard. I live in Scotland. Um, I'm retired, and my career spanned the public, private, and voluntary sectors. Uh, in terms of education, I suspect I probably learnt rather more since I left school than at school. Don't think my school prepared me for the working life I've had. And I care passionately that young people today who are facing a very uncertain world actually have the best, maybe portfolio skills, education that society can give them. Excellent. Great introduction there. And over to you, Mark. Hi, um, I'm Mark Timmins. Um uh one of the people who set up a um an award-winning um employability charity called works plus um we work in the scottish borders and uh, my career goes from um working uh in in manufacturing but um through uh, knitwear design and then uh, moving into education um teaching um art design um drawing Art history, um, the context of um, of design within a modern fashion world. Um, so, I bridge that gap between what is business and what is art and design. Um, uh, and currently, like I say, work with uh, Works Plus unemployed young people who maybe haven't had the best start in life, and um, we find them opportunities that allow them to thrive and flourish. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you very much, you two. And um, although it says on the screen, Ali Aga, that's my uh, head of Your Passport to Grow in Pakistan, and I've pinched his recording uh, Zoom arena for today. So um, I'm Neville Gaunt. Some of you may remember the face. Um, and I talk about can-do attitudes, soft skill development, and leadership, which is sadly lacking across the world. So I think we've got three good panellists today, including myself, that have all been through the ringer over the years, um, have got no axe to grind, let's say, and are trying to get the future in a better position than where we have been, because we're answering the question, hopefully answering the question, what's the purpose of education today? So I, I want to start the discussion off by thinking of the, the journey that we're on currently. So we've all been through education. The three of us have been through education with varying degrees of success. And if we were to look back over our time, at what part of our history, personal history this is, did we feel that we were prepared in the education arena for what we were about to face? Tough question in some respects, but... Um, Shall I start? We have to look back. <laughs> for me, it's over 40 years, so... Um, yeah, please do, Mark, please do. So, um, I, I, I have to say that I didn't enjoy school. Um, I got um, the, 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 the school's... Um, uh, badge for cross country running for participating and trying hard, and that's probably the uh, the biggest success that, um, that that I had with school. Um, and then I went on to um, uh, art foundation um, in Cambridge, and that was when I started um, to to realise that 
I quite enjoyed that that problem solving and um, design led environment where it's about um, putting yourself out uh, to to reflect the world, um, and I think that's one of the, the the interesting things that designers and artists can do. Um, uh, and it was from there that um, uh, I was able to um, undertake my degree um, in constructed textiles, where I designed things like fabrics for unwelcome guests. Um, so they look soft, but they've got hard spikes underneath them. So um, put them on your chair and, and that causes them to, uh, uh, to, to stand up in, in shock. Um, and then through, uh, the, through the RSA Young Designers into Industry, I was able to, uh, this is in about 1984, I was able to go and work um, in a yarn spinning company in um, just outside Bradford in West Yorkshire in the UK. Um, and I was there for 18 months before I moved on to my master's in fashion knitwear. And from there, I, I moved into um, uh, designing for Marks and Spencers, um, a large uh, manufacturer, about the time when Marks and Spencers realized that um, there was a global um, textile and um, garment making industry and moved offshore. Um, and it was after that that I then went into education. So, so Art Foundation for me was that, uh, that tipping point. Tipping point, yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, and and what, was, what age was that, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, that would be uh, about the age of 19. So, so prior, prior to that, um, is it fair to say that, I mean, you said you didn't enjoy school very much. It, it, it wasn't really engaging. There was no entertainment. There was no end no. game. Why am I doing this? <laughs> um, it, it's gone um, in, in HE, which I, which I really enjoyed. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was because it was creative. Um, but, but yes, our education at school wasn't, wasn't exactly challenging. And um, A-levels, what a waste of time. No, nope, I think that's a that you know that's that's a good personal journey, yeah. um, but, and the reason I'm asking for this is the the personal journeys here are really important. If we we could get 65 million personal journeys from the UK over the last few years, we'd be able to solve this problem within literally a jiffy. Yeah. Um, we're, we're, I think we're already um, scratching the top of the surface as to where the problems are lying here, um, not least in what you're now doing reaching out to disengaged young people, yeah. um, which has got some sort of um, history as regarding yourself. It's more yeah. or less uh -huh. where, where you were in, in your formative years. And would you like to sort of expand on, on, on your history a bit, if you don't mind? Yes, I would say that my nursery school was utterly ace. Um, I forced the local council to let me have a library ticket at three and a half when the age was five. I had to do a test. Negotiation skills were yeah. up in there then. No, 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 it gets worse than that. I had to do a test in front of some counsellors who insisted that they would choose the book in case I knew the story, to which my reply was, I don't cheat. If you think I'm cheating, is that what counsellors do? At which point my mother nearly passed out. <laughs> uh, Nothing's <laughs> changed, yes. Moving on. Um, excellent, excellent Frobel school. Um, as pri as then primary, day school, then away at a school, boarding school, which really did not suit me in many ways. Um, too concentrating on being a statistics factory, the league tables, so no failure permitted, so you got chucked out of things. Far too narrow a curriculum, no history, no geography, very little science, no economics, no civics, none of the civics that my sister had done aged about nine or ten, um, all sorts of things wrong with it, um, and so on. In a sense, my education came into my own when I determined that you could actually study things for yourself. So all through my life, I've tried to keep acquiring odd bits of skill, so, or it being on the skills agenda. So I was a member of the CPD committee of what was then called the British Association of Industrial Editors because I was involved in publications. 
Um, I was on the CPD committee of the then East of Scotland Business Women's Club. And both of those did two things. They helped your networking professionally, but also it meant that you helped devise with your peer group um, educational or professional development events which were relevant and topical. Um, then I think part of my education came actually from being involved in three mentoring schemes, Edinburgh University, NAPA University, and more recently, a group in Scotland called Women in Agriculture. And about, I don't know how many years ago, maybe I won't say quite how many years ago, I decided I was going to do two things. One, I did part of an open university degree on um, the voluntary sector. And the part I did was to do with volunteering, which was very interesting. And then an SVQ level four in the design and delivery of training. Because I think the one thing that irrespective of what one is doing now or where every adult on the basis that it takes a village to raise a child every adult needs to help educate the generation coming behind and it may only be a chance meeting it may only be something that goes on for three or four months like mentoring but if you yourself have felt that you needed um, to develop then the chance is that the next generation will too that's brilliant. We've gone on one hell of a journey there, as you might say. Um, and you you almost finished on um, It Takes a Village to Raise a Child, which is, um, I don't even, I, I've done, done some research on this and can't find out oh, who, who, I can who come said back it. On it. Oh, can you? Oh, please do. Yes. Um, only because in a job in London, my boss, my late boss, the most wonderful man in the world, was requ- was persuaded to become the communications hub for the expedition. Jean Leedloff, who was an anthropologist now dead, wrote a book about this particular expedition, which we had to help with the comms for, um, called The Continuum Concept. And guess who had to deal with her script? Me. <laughs> but it's an interesting read, actually, because she took um, a group of three or four young Scots um, into the Amazon, and they lived with an Amazonian tribe for a bit and learned how that village brought up the children in the village. Um, and it was a continuum, and it was all ge- intergenerational, and it was the entire village, basically. Gotcha, gotcha. I always see it as it always comes up as um, African proverb or or an Indian saying or something. But... Um, it, it makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. fundamentally, it makes sense. And in in essence, it's the it's the forerunner of modern education. Uh, yes, and the end story to the expedition is that um, my boss managed very successfully to be away the weekend the expedition returned. <laughs> I was babysitting my now very adult nephews. Telephone goes. One of my colleagues in London says, oh, I think you may need to come to London. And I say, why? Well, he said, we've had this telegram which says, um, returning with armadillo, please arrange assistance from the zoo and food. Um, So that's when education has to be part resilience because you have to get other people to come and do the babysitting. Then you have to get to London. Then you have to deal with the zoo and and the food for the armadillo. So it's actually, if education is anything, it's bringing out in people the capacity to know where to go, what to do. It's a bit like Kipling, isn't it? Kipling serving men. Yep. But, yep. So there you go. Yep, you're absolutely right. And and the interesting thing is it's all been done before. You know, it's not just been done in the, the sort of formal education years that we see in the last, say, 120 years. Um but it's been done long, long before. You know, the, the purpose of the elders of the village was to pass on knowledge, mm. to mentor young people. Um, the, the parenting that we call today is about doing some of the wonderful things that you've got behind you, Mark. You know, if you enjoy it, do it. You know, yeah. um, sure. and that's the whole point. You know, things should be enjoyable, including cooking. And, and then we get round the table to eat what's been prepared. Because that's part of growing up too. Um, so the foundations for education really are thousands of years old. Um, in, in all religions, really, the foundations are in each religion. You listen to 
the preacher, the mentor, the pastor, um, whatever, uh, and you go away and you do what's been said to you sometimes. Provided that they're not some ghastly cult. Well, you see, unfortunately, we can't differentiate between one and the other. Or we can, um, but those in a cult, unfortunately, can't differentiate between what's right and what's wrong. Um, but as we... As no, I say that, actually, I say that in all seriousness. Because no, absolutely. Because I think the level of division in the United States at the moment does mean that there may be some very unfortunate scenes in the near future. Well, I think we've seen. Uh, I lived in the states for three years, and I and I saw it when I was there. Um, there is a, a a real polarized arena, and unfortunately, unpresidential presidents um, yeah. tend to polarize it even more. But again, these are educators too. We we need to um, recognize that we're talking about education in its widest form. Um, the media is an educator. But I'd like us now to sort of bring bring back the story to um, a little bit of, of my, because I, I was a, a, perhaps a little bit more fortunate than the pair of you, because I did enjoy school. I had an absolutely wonderful Good. first teacher called Mrs. Henderson, um, who, who came from down under. I mean, she was uh, Polynesian and she was absolutely delightful, you know. Um, everyone loved her. Uh, and I suppose that set the tone for me going forward. You know, uh, all teachers I believed in. I mean, why would a teacher tell me something that wasn't true? Um, why would my parents tell me something that wasn't true? And then I was fortunate to go through a grammar school system. Um, again, I enjoyed it. I, it was all boys, 600 boys in a, in a grammar school in Greenwich. And then... <laughs> It was automatic. I was going to university, um, not just because most of those that were in the sixth form went to university, but my brother went to university, so I was going too. Um, I didn't come from a wealthy family at all. We were from Leeds, and we moved to London when I was six months old. So um, we, my father worked for the Ministry of Defence, so he wasn't exactly, um, you know, up there as far as salary was concerned. And I was one of four boys, and we all ultimately went through the same school. Um, and then uh, at the end of university, I got a job, <laughs> you know, because my teachers had told me, get a good degree, get a good job. And guess what? I got a good job. You know, I was, I got a graduate job. I went to work for Blue Circle, who both of you probably remember um, in Cement. the days. Cement. Cement, yeah. I mean, they, and they were well known because they, surprisingly enough, their logo was a Blue Circle. Um, that Lafarge took over about 15 years ago. And I had a really good education there, actually. I qualified as an accountant, and um, uh, and I knew everything about the business. It was a very paternal business. So I knew everything about manufacturing. I mean, cement, actually, was a, was a sideline, really. And I had this... Um, I had this... Uh, I was like a sponge. I wanted to know more. You know, from a very early age, and I bet you two were the same. Mm. Why? Why? Oh. Why? What do you mean? Don't understand that. Tell me, tell me, yeah, tell me why. And I can see, I can see Mark's laughing because that's what <laughs> kids do. Yeah, my, 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 mine is about making things, which is the, it, it, it's the quid pro quo of why. Yeah. Uh, you know, so. Uh, yes, if I could come in there. I, it, if we ever used to ask our parents, my sister and I, how to spell something, they would say, look it up in the dictionary, to which the answer was, well, if it's psychology, I'm not sure where to start, which became sort of family byword. The other thing was actually encyclopedias and reference books. Um, and that, in a way, is a danger of the internet, because, yes, you can go on roading and squealing and scrolling and all the rest of it on the internet, and uh, I've become fairly addicted. But one of the important things, it seems to me, about education is um, get, asking young people or encouraging young people to ensure that they have a diversity of sources of information so that they learn to um, assess, review, and come to an opinion. And they don't take the first one that comes up on the screen. The joy of reference books is you look up one thing and you turn the pages and you find something else. And yes, you can do that on screen. 
but you don't actually know terribly well the source of that information. Whereas um, some, most major publishing houses that publish books do so responsibly. And so that is something that you can have by your side to continue to look at. And I think we, we lose sight of the value of books at our peril. I think you're absolutely right there. And I just want to pick up one little snippet about referencing. Um, we're in a very fortunate arena now where Google it and all of a sudden, you know, no matter what you Google, there's a trillion answers that come back in less than a half a second. Um, but as you quite rightly said, Anne, um, who's telling you the truth? Which one's right? You know, which is a fanatic? Um, and I just want to t relay a story that, that I remember fondly when I was doing my thesis at university. It was a 50,000 word thesis. This was not short, a short report. And in there, we were told you must reference, if you quote anything, you need to reference the source. Mm. Well, I must have had about 14 pages in the appendix of references. And I had a really good tutor at the time, and uh, I handed it in, and he turned straight to the references. And within about, by the time he got to the third reference, he said, I've never seen that before. And I just turned around and said, well, you're always telling me to, to, <laughs> to, to read around the subject. So I started to read around the subject. Um, so he wasn't really interested in the content yeah. of the thesis. It was... Where were the references coming from? Well, we must have spent an hour and a half chatting through why these ref why I'd picked up these references and where on earth I got them from. Because in those days, you couldn't Google it. You know, I'm going back 40 years, 42 years. No, Google was just a, a twinkle in someone's mindset. Um, it was just the library. Yeah. And and if you've ever been to a university, there's a there's a there's a long stay library and a short stay library. And to get a book out the short stay, sometimes you couldn't even take it out of the library. You actually physically sit there for two hours, and they ticked you off, and then mm. someone else read it. So um, I'd never been more well read in my life when I when I actually submitted my thesis. But it was he was challenging all mm. of the areas that I would bring it up. Yeah, Anne, go ahead. But that demonstrates the absolute need for um, a curious, and in the right sense of the word in this context, acquisitive mind that looks for breadth before it decides it knows a fact or a perspective. And one of the worries I have about the internet is that because of algorithms and other things, uh, and it goes as much perhaps for reading reading newspapers or reading things online, you may end up only with your kind of echo chamber and therefore not learn. I went online very late the other night to watch an American friend of mine who's a pollster do a seminar with some colleagues from Buenos Aires. Um, when I registered, it didn't indicate it was for members only. And so then they said, oh, sorry, you aren't a member. So I wrote back and said, they will, you know, know the speaker very well, um, meet him regularly in Scotland. And they said, oh, delighted, come as a guest. And for me, that was fascinating because their take on international relations from Buenos Aires was quite different from Washington or London. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be open-minded. It's like buying CDs. Some shop assistant in Edinburgh thought, well, quite rightly, probably, I was absolutely off the planet when I once bought 20 CDs of composers I didn't know, including some taster discs, to which my reply very simply was, well, frankly, you've got to get beyond Beethoven's Fifth Symphony and you've got to open your mind to composers you don't know because you may suddenly think they're absolutely fantastic. Yep. And so she just shook her head at me and, you know, rang it up on the teal and out I went with my CDs. But you have to... You have to open your mind. You have to explore. You have to... Notice you above all, you have to listen and learn because a chance conversation with somebody means you might learn something invaluable. So you never stop learning, but you've got to have, hopefully, that curiosity. But, 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 but I think also the ability to listen as well. Yeah, absolutely. 
You know, um, a, a lot of people don't listen. Yes, there was an interesting thing on LinkedIn the other day about empathetic and generalist and something else listening. I could probably find the quote. Um, mm. And it's not only listening at the time, it's how you respond to what you've listened to. Mm -hmm. And also perhaps storing it for remembering later. Because if it has to do with somebody who's either le learning something or hit a particular problem in their life, they may need support then, but they also may need support a bit later on. So you always need to listen, I think, terribly carefully and be very careful in your response, actually. Yeah. Well, they talk, they talk about these days, um, because people don't listen, they have to um, create another term. So it's called active listening. Um, frankly, I'm not too sure the difference between listening and active listening. Um, someone did try and explain it to me, but I never really understood it. Oh, um, I do. I know. Well, whether you're either Listen. listening or you're not. So. No. <laughs> no, no, no. Listen, listening is the Labrador who's asleep. Active <laughs> listening is when they hear a dish rattled. <laughs> well, there you go. All right, I will... I will remember that one. <laughs> I will, no, it's fine. It's fine. Because the thing is, like anything else, we all, you can always learn when you're laughing. Because, um, and it's funny, um, the, the, it wasn't until about 20 years ago that I realised that listen and silent were exactly the same letters, but just slightly different. Mm. Um, and um, also and you... Exactly. You, you get to know these things after a while, after you've been on the speaking circuit and you hear it from someone else, which is great because the good stuff you try and repeat um, and the bad stuff you tend to ignore. Um, we're back to listening again. So, But the thing is, I mean, this is a classic example. Do, does school teach us to listen? Now, the very, the very, the, the, the very thing here, you're having to think. It should be yes. Mm -hmm. Don't you think it should in, in the in the world where we are moving out of education, the answer should be yes, of course. Mm -hmm. But you're having to think about it. Two seasoned professionals here are having to think, well, do they? So I'm yeah. guessing the answer is no. Mm. I, I, I think I think people are trained to to, to listen for the next instruction. Um, you know, um, move to page four in your in your books rather than listen and then think for yourself, what do I do next? And I think that's the difference. You know, um, when you get out of a formal education system, you and and you don't have the structure and the the, the sort of linear. Um, we're going to from point A to point B to point C to point D, and you start and thinking to yourself, well, I don't need to go to B and C, but I can go to D, and then maybe I need to go back to B, and then I can go off to off to X. Um, and sometimes I, I I I think I get that through my design education because that the, there is no right solution in terms of. Um, of, of design, there are a set of parameters, and how you manipulate within those parameters is how you get to a solution, as opposed to a linear um, process. Yeah, go, go, Anne, go. Free format, remember. That's very much what Phil Cleaver was saying on a webinar yesterday about design education, that it, the danger of the computer and the need to listen, collaborate, brainstorm, play, be creative with colleagues. Very interesting talk yesterday. Um, and that again is you need to listen, as it were, to the brief before you start doing anything because it may take you off at a tangent you hadn't thought of before. Mm -hmm. um, I was terribly impressed with this talk yesterday. Well, you would have been impressed with the uh, keynote speaker of this very conference because we're part of the Valencia Design Education Forum mm. here, 2020, which is all virtual. Um, and this is one of the breakout workshops that we were talking about. 
And the keynote speaker is a guy called Carol, and I do apologize if I'm saying this wrong, Carol Vrendenberg, who's the chief um, uh, designer at IBM. And he was saying very much the same thing, And you know, someone who'd been around the block quite a bit, and this is how we are designing our future. Um, and, I, and I think a, a lot of the designing are in, this is why I'm a bit concerned about where art is being ignored uh, in secondary schools in many respects, <clears throat> because design in many respects is art. I mean, that's, yeah. where it, that's where it comes from, you know, a bridge design or the design of this class, for instance, you know, it comes from an artist. And, um, you know, even the design of the <coughs> chemicals that are going in comes from, you know, some recipe somewhere who someone has been creative. You know, we're using uh, another word, which is sadly lost in education, I think. You know, being creative, going, as you said, Mark, rather than going linear, A, B, C, D. Um, well, who said you can't go from A to D? Mm -hmm. there, there was a, a, a great um, uh, leadership uh, uh, program called um, Form, Storm, Norm, Perform. Yeah. There is no rule that says you can't form and go to perform. Mm -hmm. But everyone says, no, you've got to go through the brainstorming. You've got to get everyone on the same page. And I said, well, why not get everyone on the same page while doing something? Yeah. Start performing. You know, you're here for a reason. Start doing it. Um, and actually through my oil and gas career, that's what I did. We, we knew what the problem was. We created a team and off we went. We didn't have to storm it or... Norm it, we just went and performed. Mm. Um, it's called Tuckman, if anyone um, is interested in, in listening, that interested in looking up. And it was around for years, but everyone thought it was linear. Mm. But again, if you're creative, you throw linear out the door, you know. Um, another one is, oh, it's out of my comfort zone. And I said, well, what's a comfort zone? You know, it's out of the box thinking. And I say, what box? Yep. It's it's only a creation of, of what's going on between these five inches. You know, you can't do that. Why? Yeah, go ahead, Anne. Uh, one of the other things I think to remember about this going from A to B, C, D, whatever, is actually there are enormously different... We have a road structure in Britain, and it, the same thing maybe is knowledge acquisition, that there are motorways, trunk roads, rural unsigned posted roads, and roads with passing places. And so there is never one single, well, there is often an option as to route. And therefore, you need to be aware of, maybe it's much nicer sometimes to go the scenic route. If you want to thrash yourself on a motorway and pay more tax in petrol, you can do that. But actually, life is also for enjoying. So let's take, the, you know, the quiet trunk road and the single track road and the passing place and take time to reflect on the listening and the learning so that you can then perform. And I think nowadays also in terms of CPD for people working, there are such pressures and difficulties, especially because of COVID, that that time for listening and reflection, whether you're a secondary school pupil or working, may become increasingly important. Um, the, it's, it's, it's interesting because that's what they're saying about people working from home. Um, mm. You know, that, that if, you, if you really need to, you know, go and do something, that, that 10 minutes away or half an hour away gives you that space and nobody's leaning over your shoulder going... Why aren't you at your desk? Why aren't you in front of your screen doing this? Whereas when you come back, you've had time to process and look at all of that and then start anew, maybe from a different um, viewpoint. Keystroke surveillance seems to me um, almost evil. Um, that 10 minute break may mean somebody is more productive for the next four hours. So which way do you go? You don't go keystroke surveillance. It's um, it's interesting actually because those that and, and 
I've worked with a lot of organisations that have jumped down that arena, fallen straight into the AI trap of we need to monitor what our people are doing away from the office. Um, my comment with all of these, I, I only work with the chief exec and C-suite um, in, in organisations. I never, I never typically work at the lower end because we just don't have the, the bandwidth. We don't have a number of people that can do that. So I will just ask the question and, and I'll say, why are you doing that? And it, they unfortunately they fall into this KPI arena, and I think you mentioned it earlier. And it's um, a business cult, actually. It's a business pro forma that everybody adopts, and it's easy to stay inside that circle and say, um, well, "Everyone else is doing it." Uh, if 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 it wasn't if it wasn't a way to do it, why are there so many software companies out there that are providing it? And my answer to that is because you're so stupid, you're going to buy it, you know, and you're missing the opportunity here of finding out what your people are, how they work, what motivates them and becoming proper <clears> managers, <throat> you know. Yeah, go ahead. Go. That might to me mean that a company or organisation maybe has something wrong with its recruitment policy because part of that must be both the development of people and the um, developing a culture of trust. And if you so distrust your staff, um, they may not be as productive as they might be in another organisation or institution. But in turn, could I ask you a question, given the people in commerce and industry with whom you work, what do they see as their prime requisites out of British education and what they wish to see changed? Um, it's an interesting thing um, and an interesting question, but you're not the first to ask it. I'm sure. Um, in, in the sectors that, or in the circles that, that I've walked in the last, because I've never been in the public arena, I, I've when I retired, I became school governor and chair of governors. Um, and it was frightening when I started to open my eyes as to what was going on. Um, but interestingly enough, you, I'm sure you've heard of STEM, Anne. Mm. Absolutely. And well, I agree with you, it should be STEAM. It should be STEAM, absolutely. <laughs> I, I don't know quite why, um, you know, STEM mm. was, was mm. thought of, um, was be, beyond... Uh, well, beyond me. But I'm going to take you on a journey back to 1985. Um, I've shared this with Mark when, when on our, our conference call earlier in the week. And you're actually talking to one of the guys who's responsible for STEM. Oh, you, we yes, you told me to, yes. We, we didn't call it STEM. We, we were asked by the then government. Well, skills. Yeah, and we came up with, um, we were asked by the then government, is what are you looking for from a graduate? not just from education, very specific, from a graduate. And bear in mind, this is 1985. That's five years after I came out of university. And it's a really important time because when I went to university, about 1% of the 18-year-old population went to university. Today, 52% of the 18-year-olds mm. go to university. But let's go back to 1985. We came up with 12 skills we called them skills and they were all interpersonal skills none of them were technical yeah. because we you if you want to become an accountant become an accountant you want to become an, an actuary become an actuary you want to become an architect be an architect we haven't even got off the letter a yet have we <laughs> you know? so um whatever you want to be go and be because there will be a job out there for you somewhere Mm -hmm. But you do need these interpersonal skills. Mm -hmm. And number one on the list, if you ask anyone in STEM that's actually promoting STEM anywhere in the world, I ask them, is there any order to STEM? And they say, no, no, you need to do them all. And we put number one as communication. Now, interesting enough, on all STEM lists, the first one they talk about is communication. Now, it's not communication speaking, it's mm. communication, listening, <laughs> thinking, yeah. you know, active listening, active thinking, call it what you like, really. 
Um, even demonstrating, getting passionate about it. That's communication. Um, and interestingly enough, we spent so long on defining what, edu- what communication was. And bear in mind, this is 1985, you know, 35 years ago. And from there, it was supposedly taken on because we only did the primary work. And then ultimately, I found it was called STEM when I, in the late 90s, when I became a school governor, I saw this, these pictures on the wall, which were, you know, the top, top 10 STEM skills. And again, they've got nothing to do with science, technology, engineering and maths. It's skills that you need for your future life. Life skills, you know, not just business skills, but life skills, you know. How to run your own household. How to be a participator in your own household. How to be a good friend. How to be a good partner, you know. And answering your question directly now, (laughs) businesses have been crying out for this ever since I can remember, which is a long way back because I've got an elephant brain. And unfortunately, we've moved further and further away, which is where I started. There is this huge gap between, I show in, in 1994, I was in Indonesia and I was given a presentation to about 6,000 people in oil and gas. And I showed a picture which, like anything else, you know, when you put your presentations together, you should get someone to look at it <laughs> and say, uh, do you know what that looks like? <laughs> and, and, and I didn't. I just sort of, you know, threw it together before I went and, um, and I put it up on the screen. And I had this, a bit like this picture here, right, with, with, but, but moving away. Okay, so I had business going this way and I had education going this way. And I said, the only way we're going to fill this gap, because we were running out of really good quality people coming to work in in the oil and gas arena. We're going back to the mid-90s now. And we needed people that can operate valves, you know, electrification and and, um, transformational stuff, you know, the technology really hadn't got into the industry then. So we we need to to have people that could walk a mile and turn a tap on and know how to turn the tap on. So we were just fundamentally losing basic labourers, but we needed them to have the right attitude, a little bit of communication, and they just weren't there. The schools weren't providing it because education was going this way and businesses were going that way. And I, and I said to the audience, the only way we're going to do this is to fold these in. So we're going to need to have these two things here meeting in the middle and then getting us back on track. When you look at this picture, it looks like a pair of wire fronts. <laughs> No, I didn't think of that at all at the time. <laughs> but for five years, going back every time, because we designed we de- designed a program. We're going back to recruiters now. We designed a program where businesses would go into schools, give a bit of technical um, uh, education, and actually get people to come on workshops and, and actually internships. I mean, I don't think the term was was even created then. Uh, I can't remember what we we just said. Come on a workshop. You know, so it was a tea week job, you know, job experience, work experience. Um, and that's how we formed this bit through the middle. But for four years, it was known as Neville's Wife Runs, which is sort of um, a little bit embarrassing in some respects. But there's my claim to fame, if you like. Um, but the point is, it worked. We got businesses to come towards education. And in some respects, the university technical colleges, where um, a 14-year-old now comes out of mainstream schooling and I'm talking about England now I don't think they've 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 stretched into Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland you pull someone out of mainstream education because they're not academic and effectively you start an apprenticeship at 14 but it's business driven so you have like a board of directors which are on the university technical board 
and those those the contributors to that actually provide work placements on a regular basis for the 15, 16, 17 year olds. Um, I suppose in some respects it's very similar to the thing we were doing apart from we weren't creating a formal education arena. We were just saying we'll come and give you a talk then come on a bit of work experience. But there's another thing that's missed recently. Work experience is gone. Mm -hmm. It's disappeared from secondary schools. And it used to be a perfect fill-in for the teachers because it was the end of the exam yeah. arena. They didn't really know what to do with, you know, fifth formers or sixth formers mm -hmm. in that pit for the last three or four weeks of, of term. And, of course, the rest of the school were then going through exams. So they needed a bit of quiet in the examination arena. So it's a perfect opportunity to, you know, kick the, kick the older students out and to get some experience of life, you know. And even if it was photocopying for a week, you know, at least you were in a business environment. But then they said, no, this is cheap labour. You know, they need to be paid for it. Um, there's no, you know, voluntary work. There's no value in voluntary work. Well, I'm talking to two people here that are going to bite my head off in a minute if I, if I, if I talk about there's no value in voluntary work. I don't believe that for one moment. Um, you know, I, I'm always saying to a business uh, person running an SME or, or even working from an SME, go and volunteer as a school direct, as, as a school governor. You will learn so much. <laughs> but you won't get paid for it, you know? But you will get paid for it in two places. One is in here, if you can, in here. Yeah. <laughs> and the other is up here. Because uh -huh. it will teach you to think. Yeah. It, 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 it's interesting because um, I sit on two boards um, of um, third sector organisations, one of which is... Um, uh, an international film um, festival and community filmmaking organisation, mm. and, and the other is the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and and from that, I've uh, I'm now sitting on a shadow board about fair work. Um, and people say, well, how how does how does that? Um, you know, why are you doing it? And I say because um, one of the things that I said on um, my application to the Chamber of Commerce was that I want Borders business to grow so that the young people who are in my who come to my organization have somewhere to go to so that they can then thrive and um, and they were like all right okay and then the other one was why why you know a, a, a film um, a, you know that they organize a film festival and I said because young people need that culture and they need the opportunity to volunteer within that and make community films and talk about their society and talk about their culture and and all of those things and it all feeds back into into what i do in my day-to-day -day business um you know when i'm talking to a funder um i can talk to them you know on how to run an organization and for a young person i can say have you thought about this have you thought about that have you broadened your horizons to allow you to do something you know, cultural or, you know, work with um, a, a company that makes bows and arrows. Yeah, exactly. And go ahead. Uh, but Mark... I mean, back, that, back at school, isn't it? Uh, putting your hand up, you know. I know. <laughs> please, please. But actually, Mark, that... Uh, sorry, I'm... Uh, Mark, that takes me back to the meeting we once had with a group of young people um, one of whom had learned a lot from his voluntary work with broadcasting, hospital broadcasting, and something else. And one or two others of the group who, let me say, perhaps were less energetic or less purposeful. And my horror on learning that they couldn't even reapply for a supermarket job yeah. within less than six months. Mm -hmm because the algorithms of the two supermarkets concerned had no space for a demonstration of voluntary work. Ergo, the young people thought that the voluntary work was not going to serve them in any measure, so they didn't do it. 
Now, there is something most terribly wrong in a society that works like that because it's not necessarily doing voluntary work for the, for, for, for the sake of that. It actually is that it develops those communication skills which your group so long ago thought were fundamental to being human, to being a parent, to being a citizen, to being an employee. Mm-hmm. And, and all you- I would say is, without naming them, absolute shame on those two supermarkets yeah you're, you're, you're absolutely right and and the, the word i want to pick up there is fundamental these are basics this is almost like you know you can't if you're building a building you know if you imagine your life as a high-rise building not that you may like high-rise but it's a progression over life things change so when you go into the first to the ground floor you've got a really good foundation. Because if you go in and there's no foundation, guess what? You, there's, you, know, you fall into the basement. <laughs> you know? So you need a foundation. And this is what I think, bringing us back to the crux of this discussion, this is what I think we're looking for in our formal education years. And you might want to say it's like climbing a ladder. You know, but Whatever the analogy is, there needs to be some progression upwards or forwards so if we were to all have these fundamental communication skills and not send texts that say yeah all right and the one that gets me is laters okay which is exactly the same number of letters or digits but there's a number eight instead of an a you know mm. you know Go figure, I suppose. Why on earth is this? But it's, it's language. It evolves, let's say. But if we can have people that recognise that um, this cult-type communication when you're 14 and 15, this gothic-type arena that all of these young people go to, these dark places, or the majority go through um, when they're 14 or 15, the rebellious ones, um, most of them come out of it, which is great but they still are not given the terms of reference, okay? In a a contract, we always talk about terms of reference. And if we're going to have education as a contract, I mean, let's face it, education isn't free. Hmm. The three of us have paid and are continuing to pay handsomely into the coffers of the Chancellor, yeah. You no, know, the government, you know, whether it's the Scottish or the English or the UK, it doesn't matter. You know, we are handsomely paying into them and we are um, trusting them to allocate these funds accordingly. And then we're trusting schools, these educationalists, to educate our young people to, for the benefit of themselves. Screw the country. I mean, the country comes second as far as I'm concerned, you know, and a lot of people will have heard me say this before that are listening, so I'm not saying anything different than I've said before. But there are, there are a couple of reasons why we educate people, but primarily it's for the benefit of themselves. So they can think. They can be the best they can be. They mm-hmm. can follow their passion, follow their dreams. Mm-hmm. Secondly, it's for the benefit of their parents because actually the bank of mum and dad has got to stop somewhere. <laughs> you know, the level of responsibility has to change. And then it's for the benefit of the country. And you might call those the employers because all of a sudden they're now paying for someone else's education. <laughs> okay, so it's a beauty. There's a perfect storm here, but we've got it wrong. Anne, you were going to say something. I don't know how much time we've got left. There are one or two things... We have um, as long um, as you would like. How's right. that? Uh, well, there are one or two references that might be worth adding into the recording. One is um, the Goodison Group in Scotland, which is a follow-on and, and link to the Goodison Group set up by Nick Goodison, is doing very interesting work on future education in Scotland. And their reports, when they come out, are very well worth reading. And there will be another one, I think, in January from discussions at the moment and their past reports also. Um, The Logan Review at the moment in Scotland on digital skills will have impact on education. And then the Royal Society of Arts project on the future of work 
And last night, and I don't know whether it was recorded, there was a very interesting discussion, which I watched, um, between the CIPD and um, uh, one of the regional networks of the RSA, because we have both geographic and thematic networks within the fellowship. And that was very interesting. One of the things that came out of it was the need for often education to be possibly more child-centred than it is at the moment because people learn at different pace and in different styles. But the, the one thing to me seems that the need to ensure that aspiration and enthusiasm are supported um, because that will help people keep on learning and keeping on wanting to learn. Um, and valuing each little bit of education acquired. Education isn't stuffing in for school statistics. It's actually, to my mind, bringing out the best in people, irrespective of whatever they do in life. Because not everybody can have a double first in Swahili or something as useless. It might be useful, mind you, sorry, to the Swahili speakers. But to... Um, cherish those nuggets of knowledge which you may not use today but might prove invaluable at some other point in your life mm -hmm. yeah you're, you're, you're absolutely right it comes back to the 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 crux of this whole discussion and thank you for sharing those on here when we put this out into the arena um, I'll ask you for all of those links if you won't mind so we can keep all of those links in one mm -hmm. place and, and hopefully get this subject spoken about, and more importantly, acted upon for the very first time. Get away from these PISA tables. Get away from mm -hmm. the, first, the first letter that a 17 or 18-year-old ever writes is their personal statement to apply to a university. And in that personal statement, it, you're told, don't put your academic qualifications in yeah so uh -huh. if we know that when you're applying for an academic position going forward for your educational part of life why don't we recognize that at 14 why aren't we doing um, things in the school arena that businesses are saying are crying out for i mean i can't tell you over the last 20 odd years every business forum I will ask, typically because of the work that I'm currently doing, are you happy with graduates? And, and we will have people from Pakistan listening to this. There's research done every year by, by very profound individual research groups. 77% of the business community in Pakistan are not happy with, with the graduates that are coming out of university. Now, this is Pakistan. OK, this is not the UK. In the UK, it's worse. It's over 90 percent are not happy with the graduates that are coming out. And when you ask the next question, so why aren't you happy? It all comes down to the lack of interpersonal skills, communication being one, leadership, how to collaborate, how to work in a team. And none of our... Um, exams that we ever do, I mean, I, I did exams in Scouts, but that doesn't count because that's not formal education. But none of the exams that we do are team-based. So, 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 okay, can I just... I've, uh, I've got you rattled here, compare of you, so it's good. So let's get the fire up. <laughs> so, so, so a couple of things um, for, for both of you. Uh, when was the last time anybody asked you what your qualifications were? Oh, I get asked too frequently, to be honest with you. And I, and, and I just say the reason I don't do it, and it's not on my business card, and you won't see it on LinkedIn apart from it might say a degree from Nottingham University, is yeah. it doesn't matter. Correct. And, and, yet, and yet everybody that I work with in Pakistan, they've got stream of letters behind their name. If you haven't got a PhD and an MBA you don't even get a clerical job yeah, no, because it's, it's the entry point. Yes. And, and, and then the other thing is, you know, how, uh, 
one of the, 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 the real issues that the young people who come to me are, have um, is, is confidence. Yeah. And, you know, that, that where, where do we test or where do we support confidence in a young person? Well, we don't. No, not at all. So you have to pick up those pieces before you even get to writing the application or, you know, talking to someone on the phone. Um, because it, yeah. most young people that I work with have phones that they never talk on. Well, the phone's not for talking, is it? I mean, well, no, this is for talking. <laughs> <laughs> it's Facebook for talking, you know, Zoom for talking, you know. We don't talk on those. So WhatsApp for talking, you know, we don't use a phone. <laughs> okay, go on then. Well, it, it, three observations. One, let me take you back to 2002. The RSA had an, a, a, an education conference at Stirling, um, which involved Andrew Kuby, who leads the Goodison Group, and I do recommend the Goodison Group to you. We had the daughter of an RSA fellow speaking there, and it was the most significant moment of the day, and she was listened to as a young person with almost more attention than all the other speakers. And she explained the story of not having done well at school, going on then to a technical college and being supported by one particular tutor who saw her potential and encouraged her. And it was that human support, as of being told she was being failing at school, that she then flew and she's still flying. So it was that one person who pivoted her, as it were. You made the remark, Neville, that about 90% of industry and commerce wanting change. So my question might be, and there's an, a, an addendum to it, how is it that commerce and industry have not persuaded the politicians and policymakers that that change must happen, which then, then begs the question about leadership by politicians? Um, and I you know, leadership in some places in the world from politicians at the moment is not good. So it's a twofold question. Where does the leadership for policy change going to come from? Because industry needs to maybe raise its game on it. And B, the development of leadership skills for succession planning amongst young people. Now, that may be to be really super figures in their local community, maybe to be a captain of industry, but both of those types of leadership need development. And you've hit the nail on the head, and um, I'm now gonna be incredibly critical of what we call leadership, not just in the UK, but globally. There is a we're gap, going to we're gonna to have to do it, you know, and, and if it's gonna take the likes of me, who really doesn't care whether they're listening or not, because I'm going to make a difference wherever I'm going. We, we have to recognise that we're doing a bad job. Mm -hmm. And no one in education will ever own up to doing a bad job. But the interesting thing is, I don't want them to own up to them doing a bad job, because I don't think education is doing a bad job. It's doing what it's told. <laughs> They're told, mm -hmm. and we hear it. You know, I sat through five years of Gove being the education minister. Now, he's a well-meaning guy. Believe you me, he's a well-meaning guy. But does he know anything about education? No. He, he believes he does. And I'm sure all of these education ministers believe they do. But they don't get down to the brass tacks. We are, we are fundamentally failing in our duty of care to develop the next generation. The next generation, where are they going? You know, so this goes to the crux of the discussion we've been talking about here, the purpose of education. Why education? And let's just make one assumption. Everyone's educated till they're 21. So we don't have to think about the difference between 16, 18 and 21. Eventually, you come out of education and let's say it's 21. Then what? Now, I'm not talking about lifelong learning and go on professional development. I'm talking about what has that prepared you to do 
And if you ask the majority that come out of university, they say, well, I've got a good degree, I expect a good job. Now, that, I'm 42 years past my graduation, and I believed that contract. And it was only when I started to look into this, and I said, the contract was never written. It was never signed. No two parties signed it. And there's the problem. Because we, we come up with a CV, and I'm sure you've prepared, you two have prepared many CVs in your past, as I have, and you've, you've read lots of CVs as well. Okay? And a CV is made up of two core elements. What have you done? And how have you done it? Everyone can say what, but very, very few can say how. Mm. You know, how were you a leader? What makes you a good communicator? They can say, I'm a good communicator. And when you ask them, and the only time you get to ask them, because CVs are only two pages long, have you heard that? You know, every recruiter say, only two pages. I mean, what law of diminishing returns has ever... <laughs> as, as ever focused that. The other one is, if you're not spending an hour on your CV for every year you've been on the planet, you're not actually putting in focused effort. Now, I know this stuff because I know the head of the recruiting recruitment society is the chair. He happens to be one of my non-execs. And he's said for years, he's in the recruitment arena. He recruits high-quality professionals. He's recruited cabinet members, you know, for the UK government. So we shoot him first. But um, he says, you know, for every year you've been on the planet, you should be spending one hour focused time, not gathering all of your stuff. That's not focus. It's actually physically putting it on paper. What does that mean? How am I going to say this? And we don't do it because we just say, well, it's jobs out there until COVID came along when the jobs aren't out there. So we're in, a perfect, we're in that perfect storm now where jobs are disappearing at a rapid rate of knots. The traditional rabbit holes of where, oh, I'll just get a job in, in the pub, or as we might call it, hospitality, <laughs> you know? Well, they're all closed. Yep. And when they come back, they're going to go back to people that have been there and done it for some time. They're not going to take a novice. So forget about those jobs. And then artificial intelligence is coming along as well. And you better forget about a lot of the menial jobs as well, which is good news because they're called menial jobs for a reason. No one wants to do them, you know. Yeah. You know, who wants to be in front of a keyboard clicking away, you know? Oh, computer say no. You know, so we've got to be, we've got to get realistic here, and I think now is the opportunity to become more realistic and start answering the simple question. We've answered a lot of it today. We need to build those the the how we do it, the communication skills, the leadership skills that that businesses are crying out for. We need to shame the business community in many respects, because however loud they've been saying it, believe you me. Every year, four times a year, you will see the CBI come out and say education isn't doing what it should be doing. So it's not they're not saying it. Uh -huh. you, can, you can say that for maybe two or three times, and then you have to turn around and think, why am I keeping saying this? Well, you've What's got to give them, you've, like going back to Neville's wife France, I'm afraid. You know, I, I mentioned it, so I'll go back to it. We can all have a bit of a laugh. Business and education have gone like this. We need to come like this. Exactly. Now, now whether, whether that means, you know, someone has to move. In any negotiation, somebody has to move. And this is a negotiation. This is the most fundamental negotiation. And I get very passionate about this, as you probably might have gathered. It's a fundamental negotiation for not my kids, your kids, and maybe not even our grandkids. It's the, it's the future generation. And by the way... They're the ones that are going to have to pay the cost of the trillion pound increase in national debt. And this, yeah. is where, this is where we need to be focused as well. And how do we do that? By having a really healthy business community, 
with a good supply chain of great young people that are coming through, that have all got a can-do attitude, all can communicate, and all want to get up that leadership ladder. And if they can't do that, they want to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is another word. We've not touched entrepreneur in this arena, but you're an entrepreneur, Mark. And Anne, I'm sure you're an entrepreneur too, if we it's delve been, into it. The second person in the last two weeks who said that to me. Well, it, it, you know, if two people say it to you, you, might, you better start believing it. <laughs> but, but the thing is, what's wrong with entrepreneurship? What's wrong with failing? What's wrong with having a go? You know, Anne, go ahead. It's not necessarily being an entrepreneur to earn your living. It's having an entrepreneurial mindset. Yep. Which I think is slightly different. Um, However, if I can interject there, the last thing a business wants is an entrepreneurial mindset. They don't want a maverick. No, no, no. They want an enterprising mindset. (coughs) And there is a bit of a difference between an entrepreneurial mindset and an enterprising mind. Not much of a difference, but if if I can say the difference to me is... I'm standing at the top of Beachy Head and I'm looking out. An entrepreneur will jump and an enterprising person won't. No, but, 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 they'll, um, but they'll set up a business of, um, of balloons so that people fill up. And, and that's up. the entrepreneur. Yeah. Because they've already done that. They've already yeah. done that. Um, uh, they've all done that background. They've all been prepared. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, we've got a, we've got a, we've got um, we've got a joiner, which is great. Um, uh, a, a guy called no, Navade Khan. I think I know him, um, although he probably doesn't recognise me as Ali Aga. Um, it's Neville Gaunt, Navade. So um, I'm, I've, I've pinched my colleagues' uh, Zoom login. Um, <laughs> it, it, we'll go back to the issue. Yes. Um, qualifications, once you get to a certain level, they don't matter, frankly, because your experience is, is by, by a huge stretch way ahead of your qualifications. It means that you've used your qualifications well in some respects. And I'm going to read out the next bit you said. In my case, I shall 77 on the 9th of November. Not quite sure what that means. B. Maybe that's B. It shall be 97, 77. Yeah. Um, nobody asked me my qualifications, <laughs> which is great. They just presume that I'm far more educated than I am. Well, just let them assume because, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, and that's it. You see, if you don't put your qualifications out there, people mm-hmm. say, who are you? What do you do? Yeah. I remember my very first business card when I left corporate life just said Neville Gaunt and a telephone number. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> you know, on a blank white sheet of paper, um, but um, but it, but it's great. I mean, we're, so we're getting back into this rub. So have businesses said it? Yes, they have. Um, as you quite rightly, Mark, say if they've said it three times on the trot and no one's listened, and no one, more importantly, no one's actioned, then what's the point in saying it yeah. again? You know, this is not you know Donald Trump on Twitter you know, just bash, 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 and eventually someone will give in because you're shouting at them hard enough. Um, There needs to be a negotiation, in my view, and we just need to get the right people on that negotiating panel. Mm -hmm. Because we can't continue doing what we're doing. We are moving more and more towards the PISA-type qualifications, you know, five A-stars to C at GCSE level, or the equivalent in Scotland, it's frankly not good enough because businesses have got no idea what that means anymore. You know, in in, well, in England, you. we've got maths, you know, that now rather than A, B, C, it turned, turned from one to nine. Yeah. So they've got half of the GCSEs being A, B, C, and, and two or three of the GCSEs which are ranked one to nine. Mm-hmm. I mean, if businesses were confused before, they're going to be confused now. I mean, why didn't you just move the whole lot from one to nine? You know, if it's that good, mm-hmm. why have you done this piecemeal? Yeah. It's the signals that, that that sends to the business community that they say, let's just forget about education, and when they come out, we'll do what we can. Mm-hmm. But that's defeatist, and that is not going to solve this problem. 
No, I, it, it's that sort of inward lookingness of um, you, 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 um, you, you're given a target, you know, so um, school, school rankings. Okay, so, um, you know, you, you, all that you aim at is that target because you don't, what you don't want is the bad publicity of the HMI coming in and saying that your school is a failing school or even is an average school. You know. but, but look at the consequences of that. I mean, the HMI should come in. I, I actually believe the HMI is, is, is a great arena. But like any, uh, from an audit perspective in corporate life, I would embrace the audit team, the external auditors. You know, I want to have a clean bill of health, but more importantly, I want you to help me get the clean bill of health. Yeah. Oh, so, oh, absolutely. Yeah. So rather than this, and, and I've only met one or two HMIs that think that way. You know, they, they sort of in and, and they all give you this um, in confidence discussion before they give you the final report. Yeah. But some go that extra mile and say, you're not you're not that far away from an excellent. But we can't give you an excellent because your results are not good enough. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, they haven't got the mechanism or the power to put that in the report. Yeah. And this is where I think we need to change the HMI arena as, and as, as embracing the schools. And rather than waiting for them to fail, or while, rather than the, the three-year cycle or the four-year cycle where uh, you get a call at four o'clock on a Monday afternoon and they say, we're coming in tomorrow, and all of the senior leadership team are in that evening, along with all the senior governors, you know, grabbing paper from everywhere, putting these packs together. You know, it is Armageddon, frankly. I mean, it shouldn't be that way. It should be a partnership. You know, it, that's really interesting because I work in the third sector um, and I, I have a, a range of funders um, who who provide us with the opportunity to um, to work with the young people that we do. And I uh, um, if they give me if they give me money, I have to report on what we've done. Yeah. But they will come and they will have an interim visit. They will, uh, they will send me newsletters, or they'll invite me to to meetings. And there's a real want and desire for the organisation to succeed and improve, rather than saying, you know, the the one that I'm currently doing says, tell us about what hasn't worked and why. Not because they that they, they they want to to knock me on the head and not give me my money for the third year, but because that they they fund a lot of um, organisations, so so they use that information mm -hmm. to to see whether that is happening across the sector or whether um, there are things that um, that they've seen from other organisations that they can turn around to us and say, have you looked at this? Have you have you done that? And that's the way that that, that process should work. And that's great. If I just interject quickly, Anne, it's great because as for those that are listening that don't know the difference, it's restricted and unrestricted funds. Yeah. So what you were talking about were potentially restricted funds. In other words, you've got a particular target and you have to report on that. However, the whole purpose of this funding arena, you know, these big funders, mm -hmm. is surely to share best practice yeah. and, and make it next time that the things that you don't get as good as you were expecting, mm -hmm. there may be someone else that can backfill mm -hmm. that for you and, and collaboratively work with you. Mm -hmm. So one plus one is definitely greater than two. I mean, we are talking about charity funding here. So if, we, if we're if we not getting one plus one is greater than two, we've got a bit of a problem. Anyway, sorry, Anne, I, I jumped in. No, it's all right. That learning from failure, there's a different mindset, I think, in America, isn't it, that you learn from failure and get yourself up and start again. The other thing, interestingly, about what Mark's just said about it dialogue with funders, that's probably particularly pertinent at the moment because all organisations are facing challenges they may not have had before because of COVID. And so that learning from other people's experience may be inordinately helpful across the third 
sector is one comment I would make. The other thing, when I mentioned Goodison and the other things, one very interesting report which came up for I mentioned then, and I mentioned now, is the report by Graham Donaldson for the Welsh government. Um, and interestingly, as Andrew Kubi pointed out, very often when reports are prepared for government, they take the bits they like and take credit for those and don't deal with the rest. They are actually implementing each and every recommendation by Graham Donaldson, who frankly is an extraordinary man, cogent, calm, credible, above all, inspirational. So my suggestion would be that people read the report. I haven't read it, but I'm going to. And certainly his slides the other night um, were fascinating. The Goodison meetings are held under Chatham House rule, so that in that sense they can't be repeated and attributed. But uh, um, if you ever do another of these webinars, then I think he would be a terrific person to have on board. Um, because I think, you know, if you have got a government to take your report in entirety, mm. it's made sense. <laughs> so, you know, maybe it makes <laughs> sense for other bits of, of the United Kingdom as well as Wales. <laughs> there's, there's this classic <laughs> phrase, you know, common sense is rarely common practice. Um, and I think um, I'd like to sort of bring this to a bit of a close here because um, conscious of time, um, but more importantly, um, I've thoroughly enjoyed the pair of you being on here. We, we've given, uh, I think, a fair assessment of what the situation currently is. But I'm going to go back to each of you and just ask you to wrap up your little little piece you know we were asking this question um very simply what's the purpose of education mm -hmm. um those that listen to this whole thing will hear it but closing remarks actually will get them to focus so whichever one of you don't wants to put your hand up. oh here we go <laughs> <laughs> mark mark put his hand up so he's the first one off you go mark so, um it's, it, it's really short and sweet. The, the, the purpose of education is to make a better person. For me. That, that, that is short and sweet. Um, I would give that one big, big tick in the box. And Oh, purpose of education. To develop the best in every single person so that they have a really purposeful and enjoyable life. Both said with an awful lot of passion. I think one added... To the other one, we, there was a bit more depth. Um, I'm not going to actually answer the question. I'm going to make a plea to those that listened to Neville's wife rants. We need to negotiate. We need to collaborate. We need to move closer together. Education is going down a route which is almost like implosion. And I'm not just talking about the UK here. I'm actually talking about globally. We are... If you imagine a child starts school and they're an empty chasm mm -hmm. and we're just filling up that empty chasm. And unfortunately, as the old parable says, you know, some fell on stony ground. Yeah. Unless that child is there catching, ready to catch, wanting to catch. And by the way, most children are not very good catchers. <laughs> Unless they're ready for it, you are yeah. actually wasting our time. Yeah. And we're... Ultimately, we will end up with lots of young people coming down your route, Mark. Yep. And, and you're one of hundreds of organisations that I know in the UK alone, not least overseas, certainly a lot of work, work I do in Pakistan, that mm -hmm. are reaching out to the disengaged. So we're just building up more and more disengagement. Yep. And it, if the government's listening, that means homelessness. And crime. Exactly. Um, exactly. You know, yeah. All of the things we don't really want to pay money to. Uh -huh. So we can actually pay money to the front end and do what they call pay it forward. Yeah. And go ahead. Um, Neville, thank you for this. I've enjoyed taking part. But before you close, I want to pay a tribute to Mark. He's a finalist in an innovation in politics, um, pan-European um, project 
I encourage him to apply because I'm full of admiration for the work he does with young people. And we need to keep in mind those young people who are the, the group with which Mark works. So um, good on you, Mark. Keep at it. Well, thank you so much. That's wow. echoed, echoed loud and clear. Um, and the interesting thing is, I want to put you out of business. Yeah. I'll, I'll, if we I'll, get this right, yes. you will be out of business. <laughs> but the good thing is, you'll be doing something better, you know? Yeah. yeah. You know, I, you'll... I, I have said that on many occasions. They say, why, why do you want to do this? And I say, so that I can work myself out of the job. Yeah, and the funny thing is, um, I, I've said that most of my life. Why are you doing? When, when I, I was well paid, believe you or not, in the corporate world, and they said, "Never, why are you doing this? You're going to be out of a job." I said, "Yeah, thank good for that. <laughs> I can go and do something that perhaps might be a bit more exciting." And eventually, yeah. the company was sold, and I turned the lights off. Wow! I was literally the last person flicking the switch. It was it was that that was bad actually, but uh, but anyway, I've thoroughly enjoyed the pair of you being on the panel today. Um, I'm sorry the other panelists couldn't make it, but unfortunately, I think we may hear perhaps later in the day with the public announcement of maybe something going on. Um, but thank you both for your candid comments. Um, we're here to try and make it right. You know, we don't have all the answers. We do have lots of experience, and even the people that have participated that haven't been on the panel have shown the level of their experience too. And let's just get it right, not just for the UK, not just for England or Scotland. Mm -hmm. Let's get it right for the world as a whole. Because yeah. ultimately, and I'll go back to what Anne said, it takes a village to raise a child. So let's go from there. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Nice, nice speaking bye -bye. with you.